Good morning. Um, I'm with the, the Hospital Healthcare Task Force, and we've been working on this for a little over a year. In March, we presented some technology and some poster type stuff that would be in the hospital room. And now we want to present some new material. Now the task force is made up of Sue Miller, Gail Carini, Peg and Bill Crowley, and Mary uh, Chizik. Mary is uh, here to present today and she has been working diligently on a thing called the go bag. Okay, so what we're going to do is going to give everybody a to-go bag, okay? And she will explain what's in it. You'll be able to go through it and see it as she's talking about it. And uh, then we'll go from there, okay? So, Mary, uh, do you have a mic there? Thanks, sir. I'm so glad you're here because this is really a, an important meeting. Um, as Art mentioned, we've been trying to get some traction, particularly with um, hospitals and administrative staff, and we really have not been able to make too much of an inroad. So I decided that the best thing to do was to make sure that we were our own best advocate. And one way to do that was to be prepared. Um, I know that if you're sick, even if you're sick, you're still captain of your communication. You are still expected to understand and know what someone is telling you. Even um, what I tried to do is uh, cut to the chase with this. Um, firstly, there's a bag that's designated for um, things that you should take to the hospital with you. And inside there's a form that tells you um, what, should, what you should take, uh, including things like your uh, charger for your phone, is your charger for your hearing aid or cochlear implant or extra batteries. Um, it basically is a reminder list. Um, so something in there um, that I put together that I think is probably the most important document and that is um, the personal health. Starting up on the screen. Oh, good. That's the one. Um, this may seem somewhat simplistic, but bear with me. Uh, I worked for the Veterans Administration for 10 years, and on a regular basis, everything went down. So we never had access to uh, information. So if you have the information, you know that you have it and you can provide it and that it's accurate. Uh, you can take this and put this on your telephone, your smartphone, or make a hard copy and put it in the folder uh, that's provided in your bag. Um, one thing that I would add to that um, list here is I would advance directives. If you have a healthcare proxy, you have a power of attorney, you have um, organ donation information, I would include those three things also in your folder. Okay. Um, demographic information, a way to get a hold of you. Um, do you have um, a family members? Your, I, I would or two contacts, whether they're friends or family, two contacts and an accurate phone number uh, for the doctor to reach them. Uh, uh, also included special needs, so right up front, they know whether you have a hearing loss and you have hearing aids, whether it's right or it's left, uh, same with the cochlear implant. Um, vision, also someone mentioned something about vision earlier to make sure that uh, if you have glasses, that if someone wants you to read, that you're able to have your glasses so that you're able uh, to go along with them um, with some understanding. Um, your primary care provider, you can move that up a little, Lauren. Forward. Forward. Uh, oh, 
the insurance information. Some of you may have one, two, even a third insurance. So if you want coverage, make sure that all those numbers are on there so that they know who to bill. Um, okay, uh, your pharmacy. Make sure that you have a telephone number, uh, uh, an address so that uh, they know which CVS to call or uh, Walgreens, whatever it might be. Um, after pharmacy up on top, allergies. And what kind of allergies do you have? Is it a rash or is it something where you're short of breath and you develop hives? Um, so that they know not to give it to you. Um, also, your medication list. Not just the list of what you're taking and the doses, but what time are you taking it and how is it taken? Uh, some things might be a nasal spray. Some things might be under the tongue, like nitroglycerin. Um, some things may be topical. That where do you put it? Something that's a, a cream, where is it to be applied? Uh, and I, I put this in here specifically because if you go to the hospital and they reorder all of your medicines, you want to be given the medicines at the same time that you have had them at home. For example, Doctor says twice a day. Well, what happens twice a day? You get it at 10 in the morning and 6 in the evening. That's the standard. But I take something twice a day, but I want it every 12 hours. So I take it at 12 noon and 12 midnight. So that's how I want to take it, and that's how I hope they give it to me in the hospital. So be clear about all of those things. Um, if there, It's also nice to know who the provider was, or the or primary or someone who is a specialist or um, a physician's assistant, nurse practitioner. So you have some idea where that came from. Uh, past hospital admissions, uh, why were you there in terms of a diagnosis? Was, was it a heart problem? Was it a breathing problem? Uh, were you there for um, surgery? You had uh, a knee replacement, whatever. Um, is it right? Was it left? And where was it done? So they have some idea as far as looking at records. Should this be related to the reason that you are in the hospital now? Um, I suggest that what you do is you fill this out for yourself. And you also fill this out for your spouse. And have both of them on your phone. And your spouse has both of them on his phone. And that way, should something happen to one of you and the doctor wants answers to questions about your, your past history, it's there. It's there and it's there instantly. You don't have to be going looking for it in terms of um, paperwork. Uh, as I said, you can make a paper copy of this too. Um, but I talked to Bruce and Bruce said that um, he will put this form in the newsletter for November. Um, and I also left a message with Michelle Gross for the website. So should this get a little messy and you want to start over and get a new copy, you are able to fill this in online and then make a copy of it. Um, so it should be relatively easy to go through. And of course, the older you are, the more things you have ha happened to you. So that list gets pretty long. Um, one page may not do it. Um, a reminder again about the healthcare proxy, power of attorney, and also organ donation. Uh, so that um, should something happen to you or to your spouse in, and you are approached, would you think that this person who is maybe on a respirator now um, would be willing to donate their kidney? And so, yeah, listen, I, I'm my donor, it's on my license, my license for New York State. But I said, you know, harvest whatever you need. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's the form. That If you fill that out and you have that and you know all of that information, you will be the darling. I'm telling you because people don't do this. Uh, that the problem with um, communication, uh, I, uh, that uh, Nicholas Reed is an audiologist and uh, Dr. Frank Wynn 
who is the uh, otolaryngologist, did this 10-year longitudinal study. And when they published it, they came up with some startling information. And that is that about 45% on each parameter, it costs more to take care of people who are hearing loss. They tend to utilize the emergency room more often, uh, tend to return diagnosis um, after they've been discharged. And that's an onus on the hospital because if you are readmitted for the same diagnosis within 30 days of discharge, Medicare will not pay and the hospital is hung for it. Um, so all of these things are important. I would think that, you know, the people in administration would be straightening up and listening uh, because over a 10 year period, it might be a difference of like $30,000 more to take care of you versus someone who does not have hearing loss. Um, so that was part of the reason for doing this. Um, most of the reasons why this happens is it's a communication breakdown. Now, if you look in the folder in your uh, bag, uh, there are a couple of things I need to point out for you. Um, that folder, there is some propaganda in there from HLAA. There's a membership form in there, uh, should someone be interested. But you know, what I want this to, to do for you is firstly, I don't want it to, to get lost because it's so bright um, that it'll stand out. Um, there's a pouch in there, uh, a Mylar pouch, and it is for, thanks. <laughs> It's, it's for your hearing aids or your cochlear implant. And I put a label on the outside and it's your name, your birth date, because those are the two things that they ask for. And whether it's a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, is it right, is it left? I also stuck one on the inside. The one on the inside is removable. It's not, it's not, um, not um, glued in. I did this though. I did this though because I'm hoping this is your ticket to prevention of loss of your hearing aid. That's one of the big things when you go to the hospital, you have hearing aids. Well, let me take some from you. No, I want to be able to hear. Uh, so at any rate, this is something, a, a receptacle for your hearing aids when they're not in, you being being used, uh, as they say, you can. Uh, and I put one on the inside so that uh, the lime green will catch somebody's eye and say, "Oh yeah, here it is. I see it." Okay, so that's that. Um, a little old fashioned here, but if it doesn't work, there's also pad and pen. And we also um, had the pens and the pads. Uh, with our, our website as a way of contacting us if you uh, need more information or you want to write notes to the doctor or to the nurse. Uh, so, so there's a vehicle to do that that's um, important. A little purple. A little purple tag, and this is for your name, your birth date, and a contact, either a telephone number or a website. So should this bag get lost, they'll know who it belongs to. I know it's a small thing, and if you choose to, I choose not to, but if you choose to, you can take a, a, a permanent marker and put your name on the back. Uh, but. You know, from a privacy standpoint, that little purple tag will tell them who it belongs to. Uh, my brother-in-law was in the hospital for like 10 weeks. And, and they took his wallet and his belongings. And uh, when it came time for discharge, nobody knew where it was. About two months later, they called him and said, oh, you know what? We found your wallet. In the meantime, 
had to get a driver's license. He had to get his veteran's card. He had to get his um, credit card uh, all replaced. Plus, you know, the worry about where is it? But anyway, it, it all came back to him. But hopefully, the louder you are in terms of your name uh, and, and how to contact you, um, the more easily um, it should be. Uh, I'm also hoping, hoping that this green bag is a marketing tool, uh, that it's bright enough that people see it and want to know something about it. Um, I'm hoping that we can take some of these to uh, whoever we might be able to contact uh, through administrations through our healthcare system or otolaryngologists, uh, because I think it really uh, would be very helpful for you uh, and, and for the organization to um, use this for uh, training staff, um, that there's an educational piece in it. Uh, this is communication techniques uh, that's uh, in your folder as well as a little post that you put over at the head of the bed that it's a, a quick reminder um, to people for um, making uh, strong communications with you so that you understand. Uh, I'd like to thank um, our Mello for his help, and also Sue Miller and Gail, people who are on the committee, um, uh, Bill and uh, Peggy Crowley. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate your efforts here in terms of providing input to make this a go. Um, I think it's an important um, launch today. Uh, next month, if you didn't get one and you have a friend, bring a friend, we'll uh, pass them out. Um, next month as well. I, I'm figuring they're, they're costing about $3 to put all of this together with the printing charges. But I think that it may be golden for you uh, because the communication breakdown is the problem and, and that's why it's so much more costly to take care of us. If we can be our own best advocate and have all of this information at our fingertips, hopefully the the so it will lessen errors, it will shorten your hospital stay, and you'll come home smiling and well. Okay. All right. Um, we have Dr. Betsy Runyon with us today. And, and Dr. Runyon is our PAC member, a professional advisor. And this is what a professional advisor does for HLA. Wait until you see. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Can you hand me that? I just want to cycle back just one thing here. This um, Better Hearing for Better Living poster, I had these printed up in 8 by 10 size, so you can easily put them in a holder that would hold an 8 by 10 photograph. If we get a hospital that wants to mount this on the wall, they would probably make this a bit bigger. And uh, but I made it a convenient size, so you've got it. And if you put it in some kind of a holder, it might be of some some value. The other thing I wanted to comment on, having with seven kids and uh, and my own problems over the years, um, I've been many times questioned as we entered a hospital about this, that, and the other thing that has to do with all the data that. Mary's been going over and it really helps to have things written down because people start asking you questions and you're in a certain amount of trauma, uh, depending on what the problem is. And sometimes they get interrupted and somebody else comes in and they ask the questions and if you got stuff written down, it really helps. So we thank Mary for all the work she's done on this and thinking it through. It's really her production. Now we've got two more things we're gonna do and she mentioned that um, Betsy Runyon is here. Uh, she's going to present a new video, and uh, we're quite excited about this. And then Dan's going to talk for a few minutes about technology and the technology we presented in March, plus a new device that uh, we've been working on that Lauren's been diligently working on. And that's about ready to roll. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up with a few comments about where we are in this whole journey. Now, is uh, Mary said, Betsy is an assistant professor at Nazareth University. 
She's a PAC member, and as a PAC member, about a year ago, she called me up and she said, you know, I'd really like to get my students involved in something that has to do with this hospital project. And we tossed it around and decided that maybe some research on what the value is of having ability to hear better in hospitals. What is the value of that? Maybe they could re could look at some of the research that's been collected because we don't have the resources to do all that. And they did a stellar job of pulling together um, a much more information than I ever expected we'd see. And they actually created this video themselves and um, with a little help from Betsy, I'm sure. But uh, it, I, so this is the world premiere of this new video and we'd be very interested in your reactions to it. And uh, also, we're looking for opportunities to show it to people in hospitals. One of the hardest things that we're running into in this project is to get hospital administrators excited about the fact that effective hearing in a hospital has value to the hospital. It's a very hard door to open. And that's going to be our next major focus. So take a look at this video. And Betsy, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, you can... Talk to it and uh, mention that, uh, you know, you're. That Reagan is here. Reagan is here. Well, that's what, that's what okay. Yes. Thank you, Art, for having me. Um, it was my pleasure to work on this video with a small group of students in a seminar class that I taught. The feedback from them was that they, um, you know, tackle this challenge. They were a little, maybe I don't, Reagan is here. She's also worked on, on the video. Reagan Wellington is in the back. <laughs> All of the other students have graduated. Reagan is still with us at, at Nazareth. So I think, um, you know, they were, um, I don't want to say fearful, but maybe app apprehensive about tackling this, but I feel like that they did a really great job and they gained a great understanding of the importance and challenges that individuals with hearing loss can face in hospitals. So with that, I think we could start the video. The importance of communication access in hospitals for adults with hearing loss. Communication access. Everyone benefits. Did you know 10% of Americans, aged 12 and up, have hearing loss? About 1 in 3 adults, 65 to 74 years, has at least a mild hearing loss. And the prevalence increases to 73% for adults 75 years and older. 80% of adults 80 years and older have some degree of hearing difficulty. A person with mild hearing loss and hearing aids may miss up to 40% of the message in quiet from a meter away. But most adults with hearing loss do not even use hearing aids. They may also have poorer mental and physical health compared to adults without hearing loss. Plus higher healthcare costs, more frequent hospital visits, longer stays, and a 44% increased risk of readmission. This means that medical care must address all their needs, including communication access. When a patient can't hear their doctor, while possibly facing challenges with health literacy, they might be unsure about how to follow their treatment plan. The doctor keeps using words I don't know, and I can't hear his explanations. I hope I can manage at home. But hearing loss doesn't just affect patients. It also affects caregivers. Caregiving time increases by 18% if a person has hearing loss indicating that hearing loss has impacts beyond the patient. Communication breakdowns are common in hospitals. 
impacting patients' emotions, and participation in decision-making. I wish he would speak up. I wish he would face me. I wish he would talk slower. I won't make decisions about my care if I don't understand my diagnosis and treatment options. When hearing challenges impact patient-physician communication and healthcare quality. And communication barriers exist. Patients lose confidence in their healthcare team. And report dissatisfaction with care. If communication needs are not met, patients will not be comfortable returning. What a terrible experience. Definitely not coming back to this hospital. Reasons why patients don't return. Feeling ignored and not heard. Feeling like a nuisance. Feeling confused on next steps. Ensuring communication access in medical settings is vital to patients' physical and emotional well-being. Medical errors are more likely to happen when communication barriers exist. Overall, improving communication access could reduce errors, saving hospitals $6.8 billion every year in the U.S. And it's the ethical thing to do. Everyone has the right to communicate. So, thanks to Betsy. So, do you have any questions? We got a few. A very important problem is OTO, and you can explain what that comes from, toxic drugs. And the problem is, even if we had a list ourselves of autotoxic, with it being electronically sent out to the pharmacy, we may not realize that that is being prescribed. Would you know anything if there's any kind of group that is standing up in defense of patients, no autotoxic drugs. Can you fill us in? Uh, I do know that uh, Dr. Dutcher has spoke on this topic a number of times over the years, and I know that there is a listing um, of these things, uh, uh, aspirin being one, uh, uh, some chemotherapeutic drugs also um, may cause hearing loss. If you think you'd like to have a copy of that, we could put it in the newsletter. Um, I'm sure it would be really easy to pull together. Um, I don't know if you think that's worthwhile. We could add that in there. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, going back to uh, the Go Kit. And one of the things that I was thinking about is those of us that have hearing aids that have to be rechargeable and that that you go to the hospital for any kind of stay 
you're going to lose the access to your hearing aids very quickly. So would there be a benefit to having some sort of communication and that device within the hospital that somebody could help you uh, charge your hearing aids if you are not able to advocate for yourself? I think we're proposing that you take your charger with you from home. Yeah. Um, be aware that um, there are some places in some healthcare facilities that are kind of a dead space for signals. So you might not be able to get um, a good signal for your phone, um, even possibly your hearing aid because of the electric um, problem. Uh, Mary, I want to respond to him. Um, like Strong, they have a, a strong audiology. And I know my wife is a registered nurse there. Sometimes when they have patients and the batteries die, they'll run down to the audiology office and get more batteries. So I'm hoping the same for rechargeables, that they can help you know, figure out how to get those hearing aids charged again, providing they sell those hearing aids. Everything is kind of proprietary with chargers. Um, but that's something I want to add. Uh, Eric wants to say something. Yeah, a couple quickies. I have a charger that uh, will charge my rechargeables uh, up to six times without being plugged in. It's got a built-in battery, so that's partial help. Uh, also, on the question of over-the-counter uh, uh, ototoxic uh, drugs, my my reading says that most so-called ototoxics are not necessarily a problem, but they will aggravate hearing loss. They don't cause it, but they aggravate it or nullify some of the things you're doing. So that's the important thing to know. And we do have a handout available on common ototoxic drugs. Uh, it's part of the materials that I use in my presentations. It's part of the uh, uh, caregiver set that I put together. So you have this tremendous video now. I mean, it, it's short, hard hitting, easy to understand. And so now the trick is getting it in front of the people who can make a difference. But I, I think it's going to be, I have a couple of things to say. One is we'll look forward to hearing on how you're doing on that. Um, there's that old saw about uh, if, if a, a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around, is there a sound? Well, if no one of in power sees the video or will listen, it'll be a shame. But the second thing is, I mean, I really, the, the simplicity of it and the directness of it is the strength. It's easy, and, and it's all, all the research is footnoted. That's beautiful. It'll play to professionals in, in medical care who are researchers and whatever. But I hope also you'll share this uh, beyond the 10-county community, because I think you really have something here of value that can be useful across the country. It's really a big yeah. deal. Regan and I, nicely done. Yeah, uh, Betsy and I have talked about this, and as far as I as far as I know, and she knows, there's no limitations, and we certainly would love to have other people pick it up and use it. The first, I think, you know, it, we've been talking about this with HLAA for a long time, and it's very hard to get meetings with hospital administrators. I'm coming to the conclusion because everybody I talk to that works on the floor with patients says this is a problem and somebody ought to do something about it. I know a gal who just got appointed to be the chief of the university hospital up in Toronto and she's worked her way up you know, working with patients and so forth. And I asked her about a year ago, I said, well, what are you Canadians doing about this? And she said, nothing, and we ought to be doing something because it's a real problem. My take is that most hospital administrators are so far away from the patient bedside that they've lost sight of it if they were ever there. Because a lot of the hospital administrators are financial people, okay? 
They don't understand the nuances of when people can't hear. So we got to break through that somehow, and we're trying to figure out how to do that. That is the key next step to try to get this exposure. One other comment is we don't intend to walk in. We have a little. We'll ha we would have a little kit of technology that we would walk in with, and they they would set it up in the hospital, probably at the nurses' station. Okay. We intend to have some form of training of the staff with this type of thing. So you get into all the nuances of this kind of situation, that kind of situation. But we have to remember that the hospitals are extremely busy. They tend to be understaffed. They tend to have a patient load that's very hard to handle. So it's very hard to get their attention, but we'll keep banging our head against that wall too. But that's kind of where we are. The other thing, and if anybody has any ideas on this, how do we measure it? How do we measure the effectiveness of it if we actually get it going? So what we want to do, the if we get an entree into a hospital, we want to set up a field test, a small field test. I call it a beta test, like we used to have in technology circles. You take things out of the lab and you put it in the field for the first time in a small group that understands what they're dealing with, uses it, gives you feedback, you refine it and so forth. And finally, you've got something that's ready to launch, you know. So we're working on trying to find an entry for a beta test, and there would be the next major step. Yes, is there a question? Um, well, Peter said everything I was going to say. <laughs> it's you know, short and quick, and, and I loved even, you know, even though they had the whole run of things at the end for the research, they had it on each page. So they, it's saying that what we're saying is research. It's not, a lot of times you just see lists of things and you, you don't have the research behind it. So that was really great. The other thing I'm, I'm just thinking in my head, I haven't figured it out, but maybe we ought to get this on social media. Um, look for groups that are people that are supporting a hospital or uh, commenting. You know, my town has one. We all are on the town ones or the, the local groups that we're in and people are talking. I, you know, if we can get it on there, people start talking about it. And maybe we can work up. You yeah, know, they would, that'd be a great idea. Nursing groups in the hospitals. Uh, yeah. You know, I think if you start going on Facebook, look for groups, you know, uh, you may find yeah. it. I, I mean, I'll look a little bit, see if I, what I can yeah. find. So. Okay. Any other questions? Peggy. This, this is Peggy Crowley, one of our task force members. Unfortunately, I haven't been around much, but um, I have three things. The first one, I want to reiterate how important it is to advocate for yourself. If you don't hear something, say something. Bring a friend, bring a family member. Go with a friend, go with a family member who has hearing loss. Sometimes two people can hear better than one. Uh, a lot of, I worked in cancer research for 30 years. And one thing that I learned was when you're explaining something to someone, they get hung up on a word, a phrase, something that catches their thought and it sticks. If you have another person with you, they're hearing more, take notes. Be a very good note taker. Another thing, we all have a good supply of address labels. Everybody sends us address labels. Label everything, every cord, uh, your glasses, everything. Put a, an address label on it. You may lose it for a little while, but you will. they will find it and they will track you down. A lot of times you're moved from room to room. You don't remember that you stuck something in a drawer. They're going to find it. So be sure that you label everything. Uh, let me see. I think that was all. But another, just remember, advocate for yourself, advocate for your friend, advocate for your family member. Make sure that the person you're talking to knows that this person is hard of hearing, or deaf and explain things. They don't, they're not medical people. They don't know what certain words mean. Use normal terms. Thank you, Peg. 
I really like that idea of labeling everything with address labels. I never thought of that. That's a great idea. Okay, so um, if there aren't any other questions, let's uh, let Dan have the, oh yes, that's he did, sorry. Thank you for your feedback about this. I wanted to go back to what Judy, Judy said, um, kind of working the way up. I think Art and I had talked briefly about maybe if there's just an elevator pitch or something as it moves up, kind of the goal of the the task force. Yeah. If you're yeah, if it's something you could share, because certainly I talk to other providers as well. And so word of mouth, maybe that's a way to I like I like elevator speeches. I used to be representing the telephone company for the major accounts in Rochester. And sometimes you have a half hour meeting set up with a vice president and the vice president walks in and says, I can give you three to five minutes and that's all I've got. So you take your half hour presentation and you present it in three minutes. To me, that's the elevator speech aspect of it. The other thing I'm thinking about is when we do that, we should we should develop a handout on this something we can leave with someone that they can remember what the hell we just said. Okay. So um, oh my, great. we have another question from somebody remotely. Oh, I just, uh, Ms. I, Michelle, she has her hand up. Michelle, could you unmute yourself and go ahead and speak? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say hello uh, from Wisconsin, HLAA Fox Valley chapter. I've attended a number of your Zoom meetings in the past, and they're always very educational and wonderful. Um, I want to thank Mary for reaching out uh, via email just recently. She shared some of the information that your group has put together, um, and I forwarded, forwarded it to our Wisconsin president, HLAA Association uh, president, Kathy Johnson, who um, very much appreciated that as well. And I think we'll be following up with you, Mary. Um, we also are in the process of doing very similar things, um, trying to put together educational materials to educate our members on this very important topic. And also um, we're trying to even maybe go to the next step, eventually, maybe that'll be phase two or three, um, putting together kind of some um, go-to information for what if you don't get the accommodations that you or a family member needs, what are those next steps in actually filing a complaint? Um, so we're hoping to put, put together some sample, sample documentation for that as well. And we're working on uh, an example policy that we got from the Office of Civil Rights on another uh, claim that was filed actually out in New Jersey, I think. Um, and the, as part of that settlement, um, the OCR had provided like a sample policy and we're taking that and e tweaking it. And it could be an example policy to give to the healthcare facilities or recommend that they implement. So we're in process contacting our Wisconsin Hospital Association, hoping that we can collaborate with them on um, getting them to recommend to their member hospitals to implement this type of policy that, it, that talks about um, communication access and uh, methods for accommodation for um, people with hearing loss. So I just wanted to let you know we're we're with you. We understand, and I wish we can you know maybe we can get try to get more chapters and states across the country to collaborate together rather than all of us trying to do the same thing in different ways. Um, so maybe we can share and collaborate some of our documentation um, and build up a stronger force to you know take that across the country with all the different medical facilities because we experienced the exact same thing trying to reach the administration at hospitals when we uh, we had this topic as a focus in our April state conference and had a heck of a time trying to reach the administration in hospitals. And so there's a lot of work to be done, but I'm, I'm really um, encouraged by everything that I'm seeing uh, that's happening. So um, 
I also want to just mention too, that I, I contacted my own personal primary care office um, to see about getting, um, you know, national has that communication access plan that's available on the national website. And I wanted to, you know, give that to my doctor and they, you know, they said I could upload it, but then I also asked, you know, are they going to see that, you know, what are they going to see when, when they first um, open up the screen about Michelle Frisbee, you know, and they said, well, there is one little spot to put like a, just a, a brief, brief sentence in your permanent health record. So that's where I gave them my information. And it should, there should have been something in there already because they know I have hearing loss and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I specifically gave them verbiage to put in that permanent health record. So it's something that pops up on, I think one of the first screens that any healthcare person would see um, if something were to happen to me, especially if I was not coherent and you know, brought into the emergency room or something like that. So that's Great what idea. I wanted to share. Well, please, uh, please keep us abreast of anything you're developing. We're very interested in seeing what you're doing. Okay, be glad. Thank to you. Work. You too. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I appreciate your your input and the response to the email, um, so that we're not uh, duplicating each other's efforts. Because I, I'm looking at it the standpoint of being your best advocate. And um, the things that you're looking at are really more policy and um, ways of making sure that um, what is needed by, for people with hearing loss is provided. And it really needs to be because we're paying for it just like everybody else. We're paying for health care we're not receiving. So it's really important that you be your best advocate. I have one more thing. Can I have one more thing? Pardon? I had one more thing that popped in my head when when we're talking about um, not being able to get a hold of the right people and that, you know, like Art said, the administration is so far beyond, you know, the patient experience um, and the fact that we can't get administration to listen. I think we need to be aware that there are so many other groups that are probably in the process of bombarding these um, medical professionals on the whole DEI movement, diversity, equity, inclusion. So one, just to be aware of that and know that it's, it's got to be going on by all the other organizations that are trying to do the same thing with other types of disabilities or um, cognitive or uh, sensory issues. So that's great. Maybe that, that will help you know, give more awareness to all of these needs. Um, but I also want to emphasize the importance that we've got to get in there and get on that bandwagon with them. Otherwise, hearing loss is not going to be thought of and it's going to be on the back burner just like it's been for the past 50 years. So if we, if you know of other groups to collaborate on that DEI effort, maybe it would be a collaborative effort um, rather than them getting, you know, 10 different organizations contacting them separately. Just another idea. I'm, I'm hoping our to-go bags will be a, will in a way advertisement um, that, you know, we have a hearing loss and that, um, that we're upfront about it. Um, I, I wanna just take a moment um, to introduce my cousin who is way up on top there, Susan Corey. She's my cousin. Uh, Hello. <laughs> And this is the first time that um, she's joined us. Uh, she has been hearing me talk about HOAA for years. For so years. An important mm -hmm. topic. So I'm so, so glad you got on, Susan. There she is. Thank you. It's been very interesting. <laughs> OK, Meg. I have another thing to add. Every time I go to the doctors or Bill or I go to the, do the hospital, whatever, we get a survey in our email to fill out. So many of us ignore it. Don't ignore it. Use it as a tool to bring up your concerns about what you did or did not, um, your experience, what your experience was. Always do a praise if there's something that, that you really are 
that doctor really took the time to explain it to me, to my face, or they were just running me through like I was, you know, and they didn't listen to me, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, use the tool, use the survey. It, they do read them. They do read them. Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Dan now. Um, he wants to talk a little bit about technology, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. All right. So, what Mary has shown, and what we have been talking about, a lot of the stuff is written down, is on paper. Everything's simple, easy to do, and whatnot. So, these devices are not their last resort, but in addition to trying to hear and understand communication, being an advocate and bringing somebody with you that can be your advocate, those are really the biggest things. They don't have to be chars, you don't have to have a technology understanding to have a partner or whatever. So keep those things in mind all the time. Uh, these devices may help you. Uh, we try to keep them simple. Everybody may have hearing aids, may not, might be cochlear implants, might have T-coils, might not have T-coils, might not like headphones, might not like earbuds, you know, charging and, and maybe not very technical inclined. Um, so these devices that we have to show are basically two devices trying to keep it as simple as possible and allow as many people uh, to benefit from it. Uh, this, Keep in mind, you may have hearing aids and you may not. You may have T-coils and you might not. And that's okay. These devices, you do not need to have a hearing aid or a T-coil or anything, really. Um, but you got to have some technical understanding. So here is a sound box, Serionic sound box. can be picked up at Amazon, about 100 bucks, And basically, it's, we're hoping to basically plug in a... Um, a transmitter, which would be a little microphone that you would hand to the person walking in the room, whether it's a doctor or the nurse or some, the lady from the cafeteria coming in or the janitor to empty your wastebasket, they would talk. And all you got to do is turn this big knob and turn it on and set it next to yourself and set it at the volume. It's basically bringing the speaker closer to you. Uh, it's mainly designed for your TV, but it can be repurposed for what we're describing. It's very simple. You set it on your bedside table, turn it up, and the speaker is close near your ears. Now, if you forgot your hearing aids, and you can kind of hear without them, you can turn up the volume uh, and whatnot. Okay, that's just one device, and I showed that the last time, or last year. So I'm going to hand this to Mary. Hold on. For one of those. And I have severe to profound hearing loss, but it works great for me. People say, is it loud enough? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Eric. All right, and this device here is basically a tablet, an Android tablet running a captioning app. Very simple. You just turn it on, hit the app, and live transcribe comes up, and everything I say goes across the screen. And I could be pretty far away. I mean, right now the speakers are up on the ceiling, and this is picking up the audio from the ceiling. Um, and it's fairly accurate, not perfect. It's automated captioning. Nobody listening in, like we have the captioning you see going across the screen in the meeting. Um, but this is something handy to have. You can increase the font. You can basically have it in front of you, and anybody talking in the room, it will go across the screen. Uh, hopefully, the nurse or the doctor can stand nearby and read what's going across the screen and correct it as needed. But you know, ninety percent or more accuracy with this device. So, this is another simple device that people can use. Yeah, what Lauren is saying is as long as not more than one person is talking. So that's where you got to be an advocate. 
Get them to still face you. Stop. Tell the other people to quiet down. Turn off that TV. Close that door. You know, these are basic steps advocating can probably greatly improve your communication without any devices. So if you've done your homework and got all that situated, and maybe you can do it, maybe your partner or your caregiver has to advocate for you and ask for these accommodations. Um, so this is a great device to have, and yeah. it's simple. I, does everyone have live transcribe on their phone? It's a free app. It's live transcribe. It's doing exactly what Dan's talking about with the tablet. But you can do the same thing on your telephone. Live transcribe for Android. If you have an iPhone, it is in your operating system. You don't need to download anything. Um, do you have captioning on your telephone? Everybody have captioned telephone? So that calls coming in as well as outgoing calls, you're able to read that on your screen. It's another app that's free, it's caption call. There are a couple of services, but caption call is the one that I have. I happen to like it because both sides of the conversation um, come up on the screen. So what you say and what that person says that you're talking with uh, also comes up so you can read the dialogue. Besides that, there'll be a memory so you can go back to look and see what someone said tomorrow, what they said today. There also is voicemail on that that is also voice to text. Now, it's not 100%, but it's really good. It's, and, and I think that it's become more and more accurate. Uh, I, I would say close to 90, 95%. Uh, so those are two things that are important to have on your telephone uh, so that you can um, be as um, accessible and communicative as possible. Okay. Um, yes. I see a question that came up in the chat remotely, and the question is, does the tablet save transcript? And the answer to that is yes, okay? No. But you can erase it if you want to, yes. And Lauren's been working on it, so it'll be HIPAA compatible. That's a I concern in a hospital. With the telephones, if you have a, a captioned telephone at home, I think it's 500 lines in terms of memory. Okay. What? We got to move on, Mary. Yes, Paul. The live tram tribe that you mentioned will save the uh, what you've said for three days, and then it automatically goes away. So you can perhaps do something if you yeah. if you need to. Okay, back to the hospital room. All the equipment that we have shown you, we do not have to touch the patient. We don't have to put anything on the patient. We don't have anything that gets in the way of medical devices. Okay? That's one of the beauties of it. The other beauty of it is we can put a kit together of this equipment for probably about $400 or less. Okay? So it's not overly expensive. So what we envision is they'd have a few kits at each nurse's station and they get a person with hearing loss. The person doesn't even have to tell them if they got hearing loss. They could suggest to the patient, hey, maybe you want to use this to make the communication more effective. But the thing is, we're trying to be as non-intrusive as possible. And um, we will uh, keep working on this. Uh, we will try to get into the the minds of the people that run hospitals any way we can from the top down, from the bottom up. And this, these ideas of getting the conversation going more broadly are beautiful. And I'm sure Betsy, Betsy's very creative. She'll come up with some creative ideas too. And uh, Reagan has uh, expressed interest in continuing to be involved in this type of stuff. And we're glad to have some young agile minds working on it. So, uh, we will be back maybe in six months or so and give you some kind of an update of where we are. Okay. Thank you very much.